I will introduce you, okay? So, uh, okay, so we, we are now live on YouTube. So, um, thank you everyone for watching and uh, it, uh, thank you, Professor uh, Chris Pickard to be here for accepting our invitation. As we usually do, let me share my, my, my screen and uh, introduce Professor Pickard, one second. And as uh, again, as we usually do, I'll first talk about our next speaker uh, two weeks from now. Uh, uh, it, uh, it's going to be Professor Julio Larrea from uh, uh, Federal from the State University of São Paulo, and uh, he's going to talk about uh, quantum phase phase transitions. Uh, his uh, recent uh, uh, Nature paper, uh, and uh, we. With Professor Julio, we'll go back to our, uh, our usual time of 4 p.m., okay? And today it's uh, our great pleasure to have uh, Professor Chris Pickard. Uh, professor Pickard is the Sir Alan Cottrell Professor of Material Science at Cambridge University. Uh, he's the leading scientist in, in the world uh, on computational material science where he has developed uh, important and useful uh, tools, for instance, uh, in the prediction of NMR, spectra and solids, uh, several types of material structure predictions and, and high pressure research. Uh, he is the 2015 recipient of the IOP Rayleigh Medal. And uh, again, thank you, Chris, for being here today. Uh, he is going to talk about uh, his uh, work on theoretical computation and, and, and the experimental hunt for room temperature uh, superconductivity. So uh, okay. thank you, Chris. And uh, I will s stop sharing my screen and the microphone is yours. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much, Rodrigo, for the introduction. And I'm sorry for such a mouthful of a, of a, of a title, but it describes quite well what I'm going to be uh, talking about this afternoon or well, this afternoon for me, this morning for uh, you in Brazil. So um, yes, yeah, so as, as uh, Rodrigo mentioned, I've uh, worked in the, in the field of uh, computational um, materials physics or materials uh, science for many years. I started my uh, research in theoretical spectroscopy, uh, starting with electron spectroscopy and moving into nuclear magnetic resonance. And then after that, I started to wonder, well, where might we get those structures that we're going to be predicting properties of from? Um, and realizing that uh, it's quite hard work to find these out um, experimentally. And we only have about 100 years of crystallography to rely on in terms of databases full of, full of structures. So I started to think about other ways that we could um, grab hold of, of new and, and, and potentially interesting uh, material structures that we could test computationally for, um, for their properties. And um, the first application of these methods that we made as I as uh, the method for structure prediction that I um, uh, made was actually to um, following up an idea of, of Neil Ashcroft, which I'll come to sh uh, shortly, which was looking for metallic hydrides, um, which might be candidates for high temperature superconductors. Now, initially we, we maybe didn't take this as seriously as we um, should have in the sense that this was an ex in entirely theoretical and computational exploration. But what I'm gonna talk about today is um, what's happened once the experimentalists have have got involved and some of the exciting uh, results that we've um, seen. Now I will bias my talk towards the work that I've done, the methods I've um, developed and the results I've been involved in. This is a very large and rapidly growing um, uh, field. So uh, I, if you're interested in this, I urge you to eat, read around to uh, many of the other authors involved in this, um, in, in, in this area, but I'm gonna give you a flavor of what we're, of what we're up to. So as a condensed matter community, you don't need very much introduction to um, superconductivity. Um, it's a, you know, from the undergraduate level, it tends to inspire a lot of uh, interest. And there are so many, uh, it seems to be an area of great possibility. It's an extreme property, something where materials behave very differently to the everyday um, world with macroscopic quantum uh, effects. But also if we could get hold of um, superconductors that superconducted at normal conditions, so the conditions under which we you know, live our lives, then there's real um, chance for revolutionizing the way that we lead those uh, uh, lives from power transmission to uh, uh, fusion um, um, and power generation. 
But this picture I'm showing you here is of the of the Meissner effect, the expulsion of the magnetic um, uh, field from the from a, a superconductor. This would be a ceramic, uh, high temperature, unconventional superconductor. But what I really want to point out is that whenever you see these pictures, you see this sort of the condensed um, uh, water vapor um, pouring out around the um, ar around the, the liquid nitrogen or boiling off uh, uh, liquid nitrogen. And the point here is that these superconductors that we have at the moment that operate um, 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 uh, um, usefully uh, tend to require very, very low temperatures. And so the dream is, could we do this at, 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 um, at much higher temperatures, ideally room temperature? So this is about the hunt for room temperature superconductivity. Now, our, the punchline is that actually, yes, there, there, there are some room temperature um, um, superconductors that have been uh, experimentally measured now. But the kicker is that the, 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 the downside is that we've traded um, temperature for pressure. So these high temperature, these high temperature superconductors we have have been accessed through doing high pressure experiments. Anyway, let's just take a look at the, 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 the sort of landscape of, of um, uh, superconductivity that we had before um, these superconducting hydrides came on the scene. And you can see it goes back to the early 20th um, century uh, with superconductivity measured in lead and, and, and mercury. And as time went on, um, you know, eventually in the 1960s and beyond, uh, the theory of these um, superconductors was un un unraveled. Uh, in terms of phonon mediated uh, Cooper pairs um, and the st standard BCS theory. And things were toddling along nicely until the 1980s when suddenly the unconventional superconductors were, came on the scene. Um, and this, these were the first superconductors that superconducted above liquid nitrogen temperatures. And this was a real huge revolution that sometimes called the Woodstock of physics that, that when this was announced in the APS meeting um, uh, in, the early, in the early days. And things improved for um, a few years and then kind of ran out of steam. Um, in the mid 2000s, there was another little flurry of excitement based around the iron based superconductors, which is still uh, interesting. Again, largely thought to be unconventional um, superconductors. And again, also ran out of, have run out of steam in terms of increasing um, TC over a certain amount of time. Now it's quite striking, I find, for these of these graphs, just how within each class of superconductor, how linear the progress is with time. I've no idea why that uh, might be, but we'll come back to that. Um, we'll come back that to that later on. Now I've put a reference here at the bottom, uh, a paper from myself, Ian Herrera, and Mikhail Eremets, where we wrote an annual reviews of condensed matter physics article on um, this. It says 2019. It may have actually only been published in 20, uh, 2020. And this, this, this article gives kind of the, the same narrative that I'm going to be giving today in my, in my presentation. So I just want to reflect for a few minutes about, you know, what is our um, status for discovering um, new superconductor, new unconventional superconductors of the types of the cuprates? And, you know, what role can computation and theory play in this? Now, I've, kind of, I've drawn three circles, a, a white circle for experiments saying, you know, everything's just fine. The experimentists can synthesize um, these compounds and happily measure these TCs. No, no, no problem there once they um, discovered the, um, the, the recipes. Uh, with modern density functional methods and computer codes such as VASP and, and, or CASTEP, the code that I um, develop, we can go a long way to, um, to predicting the structures of, of the unconventional um, superconductors. There's some challenges because often they are strongly correlated systems and the density functionals don't work as well as they do in other uh, cases, so you need to be careful, but maybe you can do something. So we have amber um, uh, for, uh, for computation, but where there's a big red cross is for theory. And it's not that theory has done nothing in unconventional, uh, in the field of unconventional superconductors, there's been a lot of work on, on theory and many um, uh, promising models or, th or theories for this, this, this flavor of superconductivity. But what I mean about, you know, when, when I say that, that, that put the red cross through theory, I mean, that if I, if an experimentalist or a computational material scientist handle, handle, handed a, a theoretician a, a crystal structure, so a, a SIF file containing the coordinates of the atoms in the crystal structure, at the present, there's no theory that will allow that to be turned into a TC for an unconventional superconductor, as far as I know. If, if, if it does exist, let me know, because I think there's lots of exciting things we could do. But as far as I know, um, there's no um, a robust tool that you could feed in a crystal structure and get out a TC for this for this class of materials. Um, so we'll come 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 back to the situation for conventional superconductors um, shortly. But I'm just going to take a little detour to high pressure physics. So this is an area that I kind of stumbled into 
um, as a result of my work on structure prediction. I initially worked on structure prediction for low pressure materials, for carbon-based materials. It's what I'd worked on during my PhD. I was interested in different forms of carbon um, beyond graphite and diamond and nanotubes and, and, and so on. But it was pointed out to me by, by a very close and long-term collaborator, Richard Needs, that this technique that I developed would be very useful in, 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 in high pressure physics. And the reason for that is that in high pressure physics, experiments are rather difficult and experiments to create the materials are difficult. And in particular, the experiments to analyze the structures of the materials. So X-ray diffraction, Raman spectroscopy, IR and so on are possible, but very difficult at these higher, higher pressures. So any help that the computational methods could give would be grateful receive, gratefully received. And indeed it has been, um, and I'll show a few examples later on, but really the, the field of, comp of high pressure physics has been revolutionized by these computational structure prediction uh, techniques. We now work hand in hand with the experimentalists as we explore the different phases that materials can adopt at ever increasing pressures. So the key quantity when you're doing a high pressure um, experiment or computation is the enthalpy, and that's the internal energy plus PV. And you can think of this as like a penalty, the PV is like a penalty term which penalizes structures with high volume or low density. And so when you minimize the enthalpy, you find within, if you increase the pressure P, you find increasingly dense materials. And so the matter, the atoms, finds cleverer or different ways of packing themselves tighter and tighter together. And there's such a wide range of pressures that might be considered from a few gigapascals that might be explored with a press, a large anvil press in planets such as, uh, or, or moons such as Titan, or diamond anvils that could get you to pressures similar to the center of the earth, we'll come back to those later on, to beyond that, to things like the National Ignition Facility in the US where laser shock experiments are done to probe pressures relevant to the center of Jupiter, and then so on to nuclear explosions, or even you can think of the experiments done in the Large Hadron Collider as a kind of high pressure experiment in which particles are put very, very close um, um, to each other by large injections of, of energy. Anyway, so the range of, 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 of pressures, you know, you have zero pressure, that's one pressure. Once you get into high pressure, in high pressure physics, you have a whole range of, of um, uh, pressures you can explore and matter behaves differently at all of these different, um, at all these different scales. So if we come back to our story about superconductivity, you know, really the, 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 the father of this field is Neil Ashcroft, who you will have heard sadly died um, recently, but he's made a huge impact um, on theoretical high pressure physics. His earliest, um, uh, well, one of his earliest contributions was with respect to metallic hydrogen, where he suggested that if you could make metallic hydrogen, it might be a high temperature superconductor. So that was kind of like the spark that lighted, uh, that was slowly lighting the fire, but it took a while before it really took off. So Neil Ashcroft's argument was that if you take the very simple expression uh, for um, the superconducting transition temperature at the top, which is proportional to the Debye temperature multiplied by an exponential depending on the density of states at the, at the Fermi level and the electron uh, phonon coupling strength, that if you could get a very high Debye temperature, then your TC should go up. And so where could you get a high Debye temperature? Well, from hydrogen, it's very light. It has high, uh, high uh, frequency vibrations. And so that was really the, 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 the essence of the, of, of, of the argument. In those days, it wasn't, well, one, they didn't really know the structure, what the, the, the atomic structure or the, the, the crystal structure of metallic hydrogen, and also didn't have the codes such as quantum espresso that could compute these uh, quantities. So it was largely um, a sort of phenomenological discussion. Um, but it sat there and as an idea, and, no, and, and it's clear that uh, Neil Ashcroft didn't stop thinking about this because he came back in 2004 having waited you know, many years for people to make metallic hydrogen and not yet having succeeded, and certainly not making a high temperature superconductor, he came back with a new suggestion, which was that, um, how about we add something to this hydrogen? You can either think of it as doping the hydrogen or adding some chemical, he described it as pre-compressing um, uh, the hydrogen. So you add some other element to hydrogen and that has the effect on the hydrogen of the hydrogen appearing to be at a higher pressure. So he had in 2004, he published a paper on this, and then he came back in 2006 with a concrete proposal that he worked out with Neil, uh, with um, Roel Hoffman, um, the chemist, the theoretical chemist, which was that maybe the, the element that we needed to mix with hydrogen is, um, is silicon. And so they considered um, metallic silane and they proposed that that might be a high temperature superconductor. It was at that point I got in, uh, involved, but we'll, 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 we'll talk about this in, a, in, in how I got involved in a, in a little while. 
So now let's, so these superconductors that Neil Ashkoff were talking about, his argument for high TC was based on a model of conventional superconductivity. Just put to one side the, 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 the unconventional superconductors as being a little bit complicated. We don't quite know how those um, are, are working at the moment, certainly not predictively, but we do quite well understand conventional superconduct superconductivity. And so now, you know, the current state of, 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 of computational and experimental technology, we're in this situation expressed on this slide. So experiment, you know, especially high pressure experiments for the hydrates, these can be done, they're not easy, um, but they can be done. I'll say a bit more about that later on. Um, the crystal structure prediction um, that people like myself and Artem Oganov uh, with his uh, evolutionary algorithms um, brought to the fore in the sort of mid 2000s are now very established and basically routine. So we can not only predict crystal structures, we can also predict the compositions of those crystal, those li the likely compositions of those crystal, uh, crystal structures. So essentially we can generate thousands of examples of possible crystal structures that might be uh, high temperature superconductors. And also crucially, we're in a position where given a crystal structure, we can compute through um, um, the BCS theory and, and um, essentially using codes such as quantum espresso, which can compute numerically the electron phonon coupling that, that, that mediates the, the, uh, uh, the, the Cooper pairs in a conventional um, superconductor. It's at the point where it's you know, relatively straightforward for a PhD student to download a code, input a crystal structure, and with care, compute uh, a TC from a structure. Um, the challenge at the moment for this is that these calculations are rather expensive. And so at the very end of the talk, hopefully I'll have a bit of time to tell you what we're doing now. We'll come back to that is that some advances in, in speeding up these calculations enables a kind of high throughput computation. So rather than predicting many thousands of crystal structures and then choosing one to compute the, um, the TC for, we're now in a, getting into a situation where we can compute TC for hundreds of different uh, structures. So roughly, what does the, the, these, these expressions for um, TC look like? Well, I put at the bottom um, of the slide here um, the um, semi-empirical Macmillan equation. Um, so this depends on some parameters that can be computed, such as lambda, the electron phonon coupling, and the, um, the, the um, average of the, um, of the frequencies as the modes, and also parameters such as the Coulomb screening, the mu star, which is a somewhat, a slightly free parameter that tends to be around 0.1. Um, that you can tweak around a little, a little bit. Um, or better, you might use the Allen Dines formula, which is a more, basically a more sophisticated empirical model, or even better, and actually now getting to be rather routine, actually solve the Elie Ashberg uh, equations. And in fact, that's probably what you should do in, in production. Now, these semi-empirical models are probably um, less, use, less useful and less used than they um, used to be, given these computational packages that allow you to solve uh, the Elie Ashberg equations. So now I'm going to turn my attention to structure prediction because this is really my, um, my, my uh, main con contribution to this, this uh, three-pillared um, uh, hunt for new, new superconductors. So in the early 2000s, having developed theories for, um, for uh, uh, spectroscopy, I, you, know, you basically hit a conundrum. So when, so when I was going through my PhD, um, condensed matter ph physicists were used to taking whatever crystal structures were given to them. And they might be quite simple. So they might be the diamond structure of, of silicon or, some, or, or something like this, but always the origins of the structures were you know, pretty much either what were provided by uh, experiments or some um, taking of a known crystal structure type and swapping the elements around in some, uh, in, in some way. As you start to deal with more sophisticated and complicated materials, such as molecular crystals or uh, metal organic frameworks or, or zeolites or, and, 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 and so on, um, you, you run into a, a, a problem that if you're working with an experimentalist, you end up with a, a situation where in order to help them use computational spectroscopy to figure out what structure they have, you kind of already have to know what the structure is. So we were in a situation where we needed to start to be able to generate our own structures independent of what the experiment uh, of the experiments that have been done. So we can allow, so we can use these computational tools as a way of essentially solving crystal structure. Um, so this is another branch of my, of, of my research where we couple these structure predictions with careful experimental measurements and use it to figure out what the structure is. So we recently published a paper on grain boundaries in, in titanium dioxide 
which were exceedingly complicated. The experimentalists could look at the high resolution electron micrographs, but couldn't figure out where the atoms should um, go. So with some very painstaking structure searches, we eventually, in iterating backwards and forwards with the experimentalists, figured out what the structure would be. So that's one way we can use these structure prediction um, te techniques. Um, but the structure prediction, you know, at root just asks this simple question, you know, if you're given a bunch of atoms, how should they arrange themselves? And that was a, um, um, was only the sort of, it was a question that, that basically uh, uh, only occurred to me as a naive PhD student when I was starting out. I mean, it was not the thing, it was not the done thing to predict crystal structures in the condensed matter physics community. Um, but luckily, because I hadn't properly become a member of that community yet, I started wondering about this, uh, this issue. When we tried different things in the early days, I tried things like graph theory and so on to enumerate structures with defined bonding, but this actually well, is limited to the structures that you can uh, e examine and also has combinatorial, um, com is combinatorially difficult um, to, to compute. So the structures we might be interested in might be crystals, and that will largely be the case for, this, uh, for the purposes of this talk or the superconductors in this talk, but actually now I'm in a material science department, there's a lot, a lot of interest in things like defects and, and interfaces and, and so on. And so, you know, you can think of this as the sort of condensed matter physics branch of the protein folding problem. It's the same issue is that we're trying to find, um, well, the arrangements of objects in, in, in space, searching through a complex um, energy landscape. So at the root of crystal structure prediction is in some sense, finding arrangements of atoms that have low energy. Not always the lowest energy because metastable phases are also interesting, in fact, may be critically interesting, um, just to point out that most of biology is in the metastable state. I mean, um, life is fighting against becoming a thermodynamic ground state, which would be a very boring and dead way um, uh, to be. So it doesn't have to be the lowest energy, um, but we were looking for lowish energy configurations. So energy is central. Um, originally, a lot of effort in crystal structure prediction in the inorganic chemistry field had focused on using empirical model potentials because it was felt that the only way to sample these complicated energy landscapes was to, um, uh, you needed a very fast way of getting energy and quantum mechanical methods were just considered too slow. Um, it turned out things didn't, didn't really work out that way in that these empirical models often had um, pathological energy landscapes with maybe many more minima than, they, than the real smooth quantum mechanical uh, first principles landscape might, might have. And that was actually my piece of good fortune because I was a developer of density functional theory methods. I didn't even think of using empirical methods for doing my structural minimization. I just bit the bullet and did these computationally challenging um, density functional uh, calculations. So this was first principles um, structure prediction. And it turns out I was helped by some benign features of the free the, the, the density functional uh, energy landscape in that it's realistic. I mean, that the, it doesn't have um, uh, sharp kinks and, and, and bumps in it that an empirical, a mathematical empirical model might have with branches and if statements and, 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 and angles and, 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 and so on. In some sense, the quantum mechanics smooths things out a little bit. Now, of course, that's a slightly movable feast. The bonding in a, in a metal is very smooth in a covalent system such as diamond or, or, or you know, carbon-based system, it's a bit rough, it's rougher, but still, you know, on the scale of the distances between the atoms on the angstrom scale, uh, the, 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 the landscape is, is in some sense smooth. So this, we end up with these two approaches, um, a, a, a first principles or predictive approach or interpretive type approaches um, based on empirical methods. Now, I haven't got time to talk about it today, but a lot of the work that we, um, are interested in at the moment in our field, and probably many of you on the call as well, are um, looking at machine learning applications to, um, to, to science. And in fact, so these empirical potentials have come back in terms of what are known as data-driven uh, or, or, or machine learning uh, potentials. So actually this turns, we, we, the, the pendulum is probably swinging a little bit back towards this uh, in interpretive approach, but we have to remember it is interpretive. And so when we start trying to look at what's at the center of Jupiter, uh, a machine learned potential for you know, water on the surface of the earth isn't gonna be very, very useful. So my method is known as ab initio random structure searching. I introduced it in 2006 and wrote a longer paper about it in 2011. And the basic, the idea is simple. You start with a, a initially random structure and then you locally optimize, you move the atoms downhill until they won't move anymore. And that is in terms of the forces for moving the atoms through the unit cell and then the stresses which change the shape of the unit cell. Now, if you do this once, 
odds are you won't get a very uh, nice structure. But if you do it many times, and this became possible because at the time I was developing this method, multi-core computers were coming available. And so parallel computation was democratized. Everyone could have a parallel computer. And so the idea of doing many calculations at, at once was just obvious. Um, this, this sort of high throughput approach also found a home in, for example, Gerd Cedar's materials project, which was similar in, 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 um, in spirit in that it made use of these newly very parallel computers, except the source of their structures for the materials project database were the existing um, crystallographic databases, the ICSD or other databases. The sources for my structures are random numbers. So uh, in the long run, there's a lot, there's probably more future to the structure prediction than there is to database um, scraping because eventually you've scraped the databases. So um, these first principles methods are likely, likely to keep the database, well, we can keep filling the databases up with computed structures, but if we wanna find new things, we have to step outside what has been done before. So you do many of these random um, searches uh, independently, all at the same time on a massive parallel computer, and then you see which of the structures that are the lowest in energy, and those are likely to be the ones you might, you might encounter in, in, um, in nature if you did an experiment. You might find the ground state, for example, in the case of carbon, that would be uh, graphite, uh, ambient conditions. But you will probably encounter diamond as well in your, in your searches. In fact, you would. Um, and that's a metastable phase. So again, emphasizing the importance of metastability in these calculations. So just to show you an example here. So this is one, so my code is available. I'll, I'll show the link um, to it at the end of the, of, of the talk. But as one of the examples, we consider this very nice work done by Artem Ogonov in 2009 or published in 2009 where he helped solve the structure of gamma boron, a high pressure phase of boron. He, and he used evolutionary algorithms to find out um, the arrangements of those atoms. Um, it took him about 500 um, geometry optimizations to identify that structure. Um, what I'm gonna show here actually, what I show you here on the right hand side is the density of structure states. So what I do is I do many, many simulations and I make a density of states like the electronic density of states, but for the energies of the structures. And the peak at the bottom is the ground state at zero. And then you have these higher energy states and the big high um, peak is the sort of glassy or liquid-like um, state at higher, uh, uh, higher energies. You can see there's a lot more weight in that, in that glassy or, or amorphous state and lower in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, um, in the ground state. So obviously there's many more, more ways to be messed up than there are to be just in the right um, uh, ar arrangement. Um, so when you do one of these random structure searches, more often than not, you'll land up at something like 0.4 electron volts above the ground state, and the optimization will look something like this. So it starts off looking random and ends up looking rather random, lower energy. Um, but about one in 200 times, which is fewer than the needed for the evolutionary algorithms, um, you might start something like this. Again, looks very random. If anything, worse random. I don't know how you quantify that, but it looks doesn't look like very promising to start with, but you relax the structure. And if you keep relaxing carefully, this is all with first principles methods, eventually it clicks into its beautiful structures, it's about one in 200 times. Now, of course, you know, 199 of those calculations might be wasted unless you are interested in amorphous uh, boron. But if you never knew the structure, if, you, if, you just, if this was an unknown structure, then wasting 199 calculations to get the one perfect one is, is, a, is a cost uh, well worth paying. And so this is my, my, my focus is not necessarily on making the fastest way of predicting a crystal structure. I'm looking for reliable ways that I can leave running on big computers and give a chance of making genuinely new discoveries. And so when I'm generating my random structures, I talk about you know, making sensible random structures. So structures that are, have a chance of being um, of lowish in energy. And so if you don't know anything about your structure, you're at some new high pressure, there's no experimental data, um, you might be able to guess roughly what the volume would be from some equation of, of, of state. It's probably not a good idea when you're building your random structures um, to have the atoms on top of each other. So you could have hard sphere repulsion around uh, each of those atoms. And that leads to something that's like a, a Poisson disk distribution of, um, of atoms in of, of randomly distributed atoms. And so that's basically what I mean by it's probably as random as you could get. We know the rough volume, it's not complete. We don't choose a completely random volume um, we have to set it to be roughly the right volume. If it's too big, if, if you make a, a, a unit cell with kilometer long um, 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 cell vectors, then the atoms would never see each other and there'd be no forces and 
you'd get no uh, evolution of your structure as you relax it. So you want to put the atoms roughly the right distance apart from each other, but then you let the code go uh, and do its thing. Um, if you know more about the system, then it's a good idea to use those chemical ideas. Those might be just fundamental chemical ideas, such as the idea of the existence of molecules or fragments in a structure, in a complex structure. Um, the fact that atoms have certain preferred distances that they want to be from each other. These can all be imposed in your initial random structures or even the connectivity. So if you're looking for tetrahedrally bonded carbon, then you could make a random structure, but only quantum mechanically relax those structures that are tetrahedrally uh, bonded. Another very powerful trick is to use symmetry because pretty much all um, crystal structures have at least some um, symmetry, symmetry operations in addition to the identity. Um, and also a very powerful approach is to team up very closely with experimentalists and use experimental data as constraints. So an experimentalist might have a situation where they know the um, shape of a unit cell, but they don't know exactly how the atoms are arranged in that box. And actually this helps a lot. If they can give me the shape of the box, I can fix that as a constraint as we did with the gamma boron case and only focus on how we arrange the atoms. And that dramatically shrinks the, the search space that we have to explore. So here's just a sort of like a, 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 a roll call of sort of the early, the early flush of success we had with this, with, with this method. You know, when we started out, it seemed like pretty much everywhere I pointed this code, I was finding new and, and surprising things. Um, for example, we have generated probably still the best candidate phases for high pressure hydrogen. Um, I found that if you squeezed water to high enough pressures, it actually decomposed. I'll show a little bit more of that um, later on. So if you squeeze water to the pressure at the, um, the core mantle boundary in, 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 in Jupiter, actually H2O is not a stable composition. It will actually decompose into hydrogen peroxide and a hydrogen rich phase, which is quite closely related to these superconducting hydrides. I also found that if you squeezed aluminium to high pressure. This is aluminium was a, 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 a pressure shock um, uh, reference um, uh, equation of state, but we found, and it wasn't anticipated before, that there were additional phase transitions in aluminium that when you exceeded a few terapascals, aluminium would adopt what's known as an electride phase where electrons started pooling between um, the, 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 the atomic, the, the ions of the, of the aluminium ions and forming essentially an ionic structure, but with no counter ion, it's all done itself. And the, um, the electrons, the pooled electrons in the little um, interstitial regions are uh, become the anions. And so they can adopt essentially much more complex structures than you would have if you just had an element um, behaving as a normal uh, element. So I put at the start you know, in 2006, the PRL physical review letters where we introduced the random searching with Richard Needs, um, we actually, I, I maybe strategically um, uh, took a wrong um, turn in that I, I, th I thought that the structure prediction was, was well, so trivial, really. You're just throwing atoms in a cell and relaxing. I hadn't appreciated how, 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 in a sense, how powerful this, this was. That essentially, it was just introduced as a paragraph in an applications paper. And the application, though, luckily, the one we chose was one that uh, has carried on being of interest. And that was testing Neil Ashcroft's idea that um, uh, silane at high pressure might be a superconductor. And what I found very quickly with the structure searches is that we found much more stable structures than he had proposed. And part of the way that these structures have become more stable was by opening up a gap, an electronic gap. And it meant we, I ended up with semiconducting phases at the pressure regimes he'd proposed superconductivity, which ruled out superconductivity. But what we did find is that you squeezed to higher pressures still, eventually, yes, actually you did get a metallic straight. And so we were not completely negative about the idea of, of, of um, these hydrides being superconducting, um, but we realized that they would um, take a lot higher pressure than, than, um, than he was proposing. So they were proposing around 100 gigapascals, and we were saying it was going to need 200, 300 gigapascals. And actually, when you look at the results I'm going to show you later on, that's also the pressure around the pressures where a lot of these exciting um, results have been found. Essentially, experiment got better, got up to those uh, pressures more routinely. So I just want to emphasize, so I use this random structure searching. I like it. For me, it sits well as a physicist. It's simple, it's easy to understand. There are the few parameters that, uh, that there are are very physical parameters, easy to explain to an experimental colleague as to what you're doing. 
you're not having to talk about breeding generations of crystal structures and have them having sex and mating and stuff, which is a little, a little um, outside the range of, a, of, of what a, a physicist might normally be thinking about in terms of condensed matter. But there are these other techniques of global optimization out there that have been used with success, such as basin hopping or minima hopping, evolutionary algorithms, um, yeah, really a, another key person in this field was Artem Oganov, who, who around the same time as I was, was using evolutionary algorithms to do very similar uh, things. So we've worked very much in parallel um, for a long time. And more recently, we wrote a review article together summarizing the, the progress that's been made in, um, in uh, first principle structure prediction. You know, the breakthrough wasn't really structure prediction per se. This was being done before. Uh, it was really the marrying of these first principles methods with structure prediction techniques. And, and this has uh, opened up a, a wide range of, of possibilities. Okay, so I mentioned the decomposition of water. Um, what I, the reason why I want to mention this is that it's important to note that um, we're predicting crystal structures, but we're not just predicting crystal structures. We're also able to predict compositions. And that's crucial for these superconducting hydrides because we would, don't know to start with what the ratio between the hydrogen and say the hydrogen and silicon should, should be. Uh, in the case of the silane, um, uh, Neil Ashcroft, they just suggested silane because it was a known low pressure, pressure um, silicon hydrogen um, uh, composition. But that's not guaranteed to be the actual most you know, likely compositions at very high uh, pressures. So I won't go to this in great detail, but the long and the short of this is you compute a, what's known as a, a Maxwell construction or convex hull, which is a, a graphical construction which tells you which compositions are stable to decomposition to neighboring compositions. So points, compositions on the convex hull, as, the, as it is said, are stable to decomposition uh, to other, um, other, other, other compositions. Points off the convex hull, in the case here of the H2O in the middle of the plot, it's above the convex hull, therefore it will decompose into this hydrogen rich phase, so H2 plus delta O and hydrogen peroxide, which is off far to the left hand side. Now take a look at the H3O structure, we published this H3O structure, and you'll see this structure again a bit later on, um, connected to sulfur hydride, which was the first big breakthrough in the, in the, um, uh, in the superconducting hydrides experimentally. Um, but you know, here we got H3O. If you go down in the periodic table, you find sulfur. So maybe it's not a surprise that there's this repetition of crystal structures um, through, um, uh, through the hydrides. Okay, so this is the start, you know, talking about the hydrides. So the story started with um, silane. Uh, it was proposed that it would be a superconductor. I found that it was semiconducting. Um, Mikhail Eremetz actually did experiments on this and did find it to be superconducting, but the interpretation of those experiments have probably swung around to thinking he'd made some platinum or, 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 or um, some transition methyl hydride rather than the, the silicon um, uh, high, uh, hydride. But what he did find experimentally was precisely the structure that I'm showing here, this, this, this um, uh, um, silane structure that we predicted with, with airs. And this actually was quite an important moment because it meant it, it, it showed Mikhail Eremetz that it's worth listening to the experimentalists. So he, 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 the way he explains it is this was kind of the moment or this and, some, and, and, and the aluminium hydride moment were moments when they thought, hang on a minute, the, you know, these suggestions that the, the theoreticians are starting to come up with might be synthesizable because he just synthesized it. Um, so I moved from silane to aluminium hydride and actually unknown to me, Mikhail Eremetz and others had synthesized it at the same time. Um, I proposed it as a possible, you know, it was metallic, uh, a metallic hydride might be a superconductor. Um, experimentally, it wasn't. And um, it turned out for quite interesting reasons. It, it, it should, it, at the BCS level of, of simple BCS level of theory, it should be a superconductor. But when you take into account unharmonicity in the phonon modes, that superconductivity is suppressed. So I kind of lost heart at that point. I didn't do too many more calculations of the hydrides, but luckily my, my excellent colleague in, in Jilin University, Yang Ming Ma, kept going. And also Dei Fan Duang and, and Chang Kui, also in Jilin University, kept going and were making different suggestions. So Yang Ming Ma suggested hydrogen sulfide could be a high temperature superconductor. Uh, Dei Fan Duan and, and, and um, Chang Kui also um, studied precisely the H3S composition and computed the TC for uh, H3S to be about 200 Kelvin. This was in advance of experiments that Mikhail Eremetz did, which 
actually did find superconductivity at about just above 200 Kelvin in the hydrogen sulfide system. So this was a big, that's the moment when I could, you know, that, I remember where I was when I heard that um, result and, and very much got me excited again about this, this field. Um, in the intervening time, Yang Ming Ma also proposed very high temperature superconductivity in calcium hydride. This hasn't been found experimentally yet, but then working with Yang Ming, we predicted um, uh, superconductivity in yttrium hydride and lanthanum hydride. And that's where the story starts to get really quite exciting. Um, so here are the density of states of these um, structures. You can see what, what I might have thought was quite special about the aluminium hydride, because you've got a very sharp peak in the density of states at the Fermi level. Uh, in the hydrogen sulfide, it's a very special structure with a very strong peak at the Fermi level, which either would be unstable maybe to some structural distortion, but it isn't. Um, and it turns out it's unstable to superconductivity. That's the, 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 the mode that it finds to lower its free, um, it, 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 its free energy. So in 2016, 2017, Yang Ming Ma and myself and, 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 and co-workers published this paper in Physical Review Letters, hydrogen clathrate structures in rare earth hydrides at high pressures, possible route to room temperature superconductivity. Now I, was, I thought that final bit was a bit cheeky because you can't claim you're going to find a, it seems a bit bold to claim you're going to find a room temperature superconductor, but indeed the, the structures that we found when we computed their TCs um, had you know, above um, 250 Kelvin and one of them, the yttrium hydrides, 300 Kelvin um, predicted superconductivity. But we, the, the paper was published and, um, and to, to our great surprise, very rapidly um, within a year or so, within a year, within a, within a year, these experimental papers appeared on archive um, so um, Mikhail Eremetz found um, lanthanum hydride superconducting at 215 Kelvin. Um, the Carnegie group in the US, Russ Hemley and co-workers at 260 Kelvin, it's getting quite exciting. Um, and then by the time that Mikhail Eremetz's paper was published in Nature, it gone up to 250 Kelvin superconductivity in lanthanum hydride. So actually, yeah, we, we were on the right track with that, with, with, with that prediction. Now at this point, it seems like uh, theory is telling the experimentalists where to go and what experiments to do, and then they're finding it. It turns out it's a little bit more complicated um, than that, and I'll come back to that in a, in, a, in, a, in a second. So just very briefly, I'm not an experimentalist, but I just want to show you um, the, the, the kind of experimental setup that, that, that are used. This is a, a diagram from our review article. Uh, it's Mikhail Eremetz's diagram of the setup he uses, and the key thing is, is the, so many people can measure, can, can, um, uh, apply high pressure in diamond anvil cells and make phase transitions in materials. But the key thing is to be able to measure the transport properties. And so you have to be able to put these electrodes into your sample and making contact with your sample. These are four point um, uh, 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 electrodes. You need to make sure that they're appropriately insulated from, from, from each other and that they maintain their integrity when you um, uh, squeeze these diamonds against each other. And frankly, I have no idea how they do how 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 they manage this, but they do. Um, I'm pretty sure it doesn't work every time they 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 try it. I think they have to try it several times, and sometimes the, the leads will break, and or sometimes the diamonds will break, and, and and so on. But when they get it right, they get a result like you see on the on the right hand side, where initially you've got some some initial sample and then some hydrogen, and you can see the hydrogen is transparent because it's insulating. The sample is, is not transparent, um, probably not insulating. Um, um, and then as it's squeezed, there's, the hydrogen disappears. So the hydrogen has gone into that sample to make a higher hydride um, that they then can go on and measure the, the transport properties of if it's, if it's metallic. So here's just some experiments, some very clean uh, experimental data from Mikhail Eremetz of the transition uh, for hydrogen sulfide or H3S and lanthanum hydride, LAH, 10 uh, at higher pressures. So we're getting, you know, towards the 200, you know, 150, 200 GPA. Um, so, yeah, there are some d debates in the, in, the, in the literature as to whether this is really superconductivity or, 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 or not. Um, my impression talking to the experimental, you know, several different experimental groups are measuring these, these uh, um, transitions. So something's happening here. It looks rather like um, uh, superconductivity. And especially with the strong prior that this was, you know, what, you know, this is what you would expect. You'd have to work hard to explain why it's not superconducting, because when you take these structures and compute their properties, it says it's a superconductor. But you know, time will tell. I think we need we need more independent groups to be able to do these experiments, and I'll, and um, and actually that drives a lot of our current work in trying to find superconductors that superconduct at lower pressures. 
because the lower the pressures we can find the superconductivity, the more groups, uh, more experimental groups can, um, can do measurements and take more measurements. So, okay, so back to my uh, plot that I was looking at before. So I noted that you get these nice linear um, uh, uh, um, 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 improvements with, um, with time of the CTC. Obviously that's trivial if you've only got two examples, hydrogen sulfide and lanthanum hydride. Um, you could be bold and, and draw, you know, draw a straight line and extrapolate, which would predict at some point in 2020, um, room temperature superconducting would be uh, discovered. And well, I prepared this slide before uh, in 2019, <laughs> but it turns out in 2020, indeed, this prediction was um, born to, to be correct. It's power of machine learning here, linear extrapolation. Um, and Ranga Diaz and Ashkan Salamat and, and Elliot Snyder um, published this work in um, October 15, 2020 in Nature, where they looked at the carbon sulfur hydrogen mixture and found 15 degrees C um, um, superconductivity at 267 uh, gigapascals. So this achieves room temperature, of course, as the, the, um, the, the, the cover of nature points out, you've got the one dial, which is showing you what temperature you've got, and you're getting it into the uh, uh, close to the zero degrees Z, C, um, or a little bit above zero degrees um, C, which is good. But on the right hand side, you've got the, the pressureometer, which shows that it's very, very high. It's in the megabar uh, range. And I think this is an important message to get across to, especially when you're talking to the public about these, that, we haven't, that we're gonna have to wait a bit longer for our hoverboards and fusion, um, and, and fusion power. But it is a very exciting, um, uh, exciting progress. Um, but I think we need to look, oh, hang on, my, up there. We need to um, uh, take stock a little bit of where we've, um, of where we've got to and you know, think about where we'd like to go. So here's a plot adapted from my um, re review article where I introduced this um, figure of merit, the S figure of merit, superconductivity figure of merit, where I weight the TC by the pressure required um, to achieve it. So I've got TC divided by the TC of um, MGB2 squared plus pressure squared square rooted, obviously depends on the units you're using here. So I'm using GPA and, 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 and Kelvin. Um, and so this puts MGB2 at one. So if we can find a superconductor that has a, um, an S of greater than one, I would say that's somehow more surprising than MGB2. Um, and I think that's probably right. According to this, it shows us that the, the carbon sulfur hydrogen mixture is a little bit more interesting than MG, MGB2. It's room temperature, but it's very high pressure. Um, it's definitely not as interesting as the cuprates, which I've got there so far with the highest um, uh, S of somewhat above three. So if we're going to you know, realize the promise of this field, we need to move our um, experimentally determined superconductors um, to the left-hand side. Now, I've indicated here two routes. You could go the high road, which is the exciting route where we find zero pressure and high temperature, properly high temperature, as maybe above boiling point or, or whatever um, of water um, superconductivity. So we should bear in mind that for a really you know, useful in, um, superconductor that can be used you know, in all of you know, human en endeavors, you know, going above, you, know, you don't just want 20 degrees C, you don't want everything to suddenly fail when on a hot day, probably in Brazil, it would never work at 20 degrees C. Uh, in the UK, it would work most of the time, but sometimes we get above 20 degrees um, C. You really want a superconductor that superconducts at much higher temperature than, than room temperature, so you're safe. So you can use it in, in engineering uh, situations. Or you say, actually, I'd be more than happy just to have a greater variety of superconductors than the cuprates that we've got at the moment, because the cuprates have very many difficult uh, engineering properties and their adoption has been really slowed by being able to make the tapes and, and so on that are robust enough and can be, um, uh, can be formed into the coils and so on that needed to generate the intense magnetic fields in, in MRI machines or, 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 or fusion. So the more superconductors that we could have that maybe need liquid nitrogen, but that's fine. Liquid nitrogen is pretty easy to, to, to make. So more, more, more lowish temperature superconductors uh, would be good. And I call that the low road. I think that might, you know, if you, it's probably the more realistic route uh, for where we, where we might go, but both are possible. But I would just point out that, you know, we started at hydrogen sulfide experimentally. We've gone to LAH10 and we've gone to CH, CSH. 
you know, not to criticize our my, my wonderful experimental colleagues, but in my opinion, we're going slightly the wrong way. You know, we're not trying to find the highest TC at the highest pressure. Um, we want ideally something that can you know, transform um, our lives and, and the possibilities of, of technology. So what am I, just to finish off, I'll just highlight the work that I'm, I'm doing at the moment. And I wanna highlight um, the work particularly of Alice Shipley and Michael Hutchian. These are two PhD students that have pretty much just finished um, their, their PhDs. Alice has finished and she's gone off um, um, to work outside of science and Michael is just writing up. I've got his thesis to read, but he's gonna head off and go, go and do a postdoc in, um, in, in, in um, uh, density functional theory theory. But while we were working together, we decided to combine our, 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 our strengths. So I can do good structure prediction. Michael figured out a way to um, speed up quantum espresso by a factor of 10 in the computation of, of TC. So it meant we could do, for the same amount of compute, we could do 10 times as many calculations as anyone else. And Alice found a way, essentially, of finding a quick way to predict whether a material get from a, based on a structure might be superconducting or not maybe think of as a machine learning um, style approach. I haven't got time to go into, the, into the, um, the details, but the rough idea is that we decided to, um, uh, to start off with um, um, uh, Alice building her model based on known TCs and previously computed TCs for known, uh, previously known structures. And then I performed a structure prediction for all the possible, well, all the possible binary combinations of uh, hydrogen plus the rest of the periodic table or the 90 or 100 elements of the uh, relevant elements of the periodic table. Now, when I say you know, all of them, it's not all of them, but we, we decided to be pragmatic and we restricted ourselves to small unit cells and we enforced high symmetry. And the reason we enforced high symmetry, it obviously speeded the computations up, but also was based on the observation that the good superconductors, superconducting hydrides that we've seen so far, I mean, you saw the pictures I saw, were all fairly high symmetry, fairly small unit cell structures. So what we wanted to do was try and you know, force our searches to find those high symmetry structures. And that speeds things up a lot. It restricts the search space. And each individual calculation is faster because you don't have to consider so many K points in the Brion zone and so on because you've got symmetry to speed things, uh, to speed things up. The other advantage of this is that it allowed us to find structures that might not actually be dynamically stable in static lattice DFT, but might be stabilized by thermal effects or quantum zero point effects. So if you did a DFT calculation, there might be some distortion and it goes to low symmetry and it doesn't appear to be a superconductor, but actually when you take into account the dynamical effects, it would symmetrize, it heats up and symmetrizes and might then be a superconductor. And, in, and this was, this was, um, we decided to go down this route because we have observed that in the case of the lanthanum hydride, that's indeed the case. So lanthanum LAH10, the, the cubic LAH10 is not actually the most stable you know, uh, uh, arrangement of those, of those atoms. It's actually a metastable phase. So considering metastability actually seemed to be quite wise. And in fact, um, we found as the result of our high throughput sweep that many of the best structures we found are actually the metastable phases. So it's highlighting the importance of, 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 of metastability. So, okay, so how did the calculation progress? Well, we, we did these sweeps for 500, 300, 200, 110 GPA. And I might end up with you know, approaching 100,000 structures for each of those pressures. But we can't calculate the TC for 100,000 structures. So, so uh, Alice um, screened these um, stru structures and um, told us the ones that most might likely be um, uh, superconducting. And then those ones, Michael went, went off and calculated using quantum espresso and density functional perturbation theory. And that's 10. So we end up for each pressure calculating tens of structures. So we ended, we ended up in total doing about 100 TC calculations. But in, before Michael speeded things up by a factor of 10, you'd be rare to see a, a paper that was published with more than a couple of TC calculations in them. So that's our, 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 our results. And then here's the outcome. Um, I plotted the pressure versus TC for our new structures. We found, we found many superconductors, potential hydride superconductors above 100 Kelvin. Um, strikingly, we found that the maximum TCs that we were finding weren't decreasing too much as we lowered the pressure until we reached 10 GPA and we didn't find any. But it seemed like 
we probably should have done 50 GPA because that might have been a might we might have still kept the high TCs at those uh, uh, those pressures. But it's certainly encouraging that the TC is not these high TCs is not just the domain of these very high um, very high pressures. The other slight side effect was that given that we'd um, got all this data, we were able to reparameterize the Allen Dines equation and find a more accurate way of um, predicting what the TC is without doing the full Eli Ashberg calculations. Um, this has actually been done even in more detail by Richard Hennig and his group um, using uh, much more advanced machine learning methods than just linear um, uh, approaches, but I think with quite similar uh, results. So just to let you know what we're doing now, uh, we're looking at ternary compounds. Many groups are looking at ternary compounds and high throughput searches for a, high, a wide range of different possible uh, ternaries applying the same idea. Um, and I'll just finish off now with, a, uh, with the conclusions. So you know, this hunt, this computational hunt was made possible by many things, the experiments, the ability to compute TC, but in particular, the structure prediction. And so we can think of this, I mean, it's, it's fun as a theoretical physicist or, or, or computational material scientist as I am uh, now, is that we can have some of the fun that experimentalists have of getting out there and trying to discover things. And then just to let you, you, you know that the codes that we use, uh, the CASTEP code that I'm a developer of is, is available cost-free globally now. Um, so go to the website and you can sign up for a license. And my AIRS package is available under the uh, GNU license. So feel free to have a play if you're interested. And I'm very happy if there is time to take any questions. Thank you, Chris, for this very nice talk. Uh, and uh, we have uh, time for questions. Uh, as we usually do, we can uh, receive questions from, uh, from the chat or from, uh, you can also raise your uh, virtual hand at the Zoom uh, platform, or you can actually also ask questions from YouTube. So uh, there's a question here uh, already from uh, David Mocklick. Uh, the question is, I'll read the question to you. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Ignoring difficulties related to engineering and computational time, uh, could computational prediction methods be extended beyond the 230 standard space groups? Uh, for example, by uh, using artificial heterostructures or, or twisted materials, so on and so forth. Yeah, okay. So, um... So, so absolutely, I would say that that's where the frontier is now. So, so another question, so I, I gave a talk and a similar question was, was asked, could you predict quasi-crystals? Yeah, so these obviously are not, not, not periodic, periodic in, in, in the 230s um, space groups. And the answer to that is, well, quite hard at the moment, um, but actually the aluminium, the, um, the aluminium phase that we found at terapascals was actually a host guest phase that was incommensurate. So that structure, although I use the computational methods to find um, approximants, we, when, we, when we published the result, we actually fitted a parabola and said, actually the incommensurate ratio is some irrational number. So not a periodic structure. So our prediction does go beyond those, um, those, those space groups. The twisted, I mean, so yeah, these twisted bilayers bi or trilayers, that's an, excite, an excited area, exciting area. I think, you know, the, the, the issue is with these things, um, is that it's just the size of the of the uh, computational space that you you're in the number of particles that you're involving. So these moiré patterns require very large approximates, like like the like the quasi crystals, and um, yeah, it's just it's challenging. I, the way I would if I was going to go down that route, I would be looking into the into the um, machine learn or data data driven potentials to you know, to expand the length scale that these DFT calculations can tackle. That's actually, I mean, there's a lot of the work that's going on at the moment is that DFT is very reliable and robust, fantastic for high pressure because we can go into the unknown. But if you're in a regime that you're really studying carefully, it's probably worth putting the time in learning, you know, learning more about your system and developing these potentials because that will allow you to extend the length scales and time scales that you, that you study. So I'm sure, yeah, so, so that's clearly an aspiration. Let's go beyond simple crystal structures. All right, thank you. Thank you, David, for the question. Thank you, Chris. Uh, uh, there's a question from a question from Alini Ramirez raised her hand. Alini, you can uh, say your question. Uh, hello, uh, can you hear me? Hello. Yes, yes. hi, Chris. Can you hear. Thank, thank you for the uh, very uh, comprehensive talk. 
Um, so if I understand correctly, uh, these pictures are concerning mostly the high pressure uh, materials, uh, they still fall on the conventional type of BCS with coupling type of superconductors, is that right? Yeah. Yes. So yeah. my question concern uh, concerns uh, now the unconventional ones. So is the same kind of uh, uh, techniques uh, able to talk about uh, unconventional superconductivity, which usually appear at actually very low temperatures? So in a, in a way, it's not yeah. so practical, but they usually have very interesting, maybe even topological properties. Could you comment yeah. on that? Yeah. Maybe? So, um, so, so, so the challenge is that. So the two challenges, one, these unconventional superconductors are often quite, they, they, they seem to be more complicated uh, crystal structures with more, more atoms and also more complicated electronic structure in that they can be strongly correlated. That can be managed. I think we, we, I have done structure predictions for the cuprate structures. It works, I can find the, the structure of IBCO from first principles, no, no problem. Um, the problem comes in that we haven't got a theory, we haven't got a way of then taking that crystal structure and predicting a TC at the moment. And so I, the way I, the way I would like, actually, it's a very good. Thank you very much for the question. Is almost like a manifesto would be. Well, let's, you know, can we do that? Can can we, you know, if we could get that, it's really worth it because we could then do this computational uh, materials design. Yeah. But as my understanding is that the, and I, I'm not an expert in the unconventional superconductivity, but my understanding is that that's not available at the moment. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Alini, for the question. Uh, I, I have a question myself. Uh, you mentioned, of course, there are different levels of, of theory. Uh, you, you have the Macmillan formula, you have Eli Ashberg. And I have actually two questions combined in one. Uh, can, can you use these different levels of theory uh, to do pre-screening? And uh, the second question's question related to that, uh, you also, you also you also have different levels of theory regarding the total energy. You have semi-empirical and you have DFT. Do you actually also uh, uh, can use those for, for do pre-screening uh, and mm -hmm. then, uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. So so on the, so taking your first, last question first, so, so you know, the ability to, you know, to maybe speed up the search for structures you have to be using machine learning, it's something data-driven potentials mm -hmm. because there aren't empirical potentials for these materials and the modern way of making empirical potentials is machine learning. So it's basically yeah, the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and the, so absolutely, we've not done it yet, but I'm sure that someone is working on it. I've certainly played, or I've tried a bit, okay? But I think it's not, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we find, see papers in that in the next year, probably. Yeah? So it's an obvious thing to, 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 to try now with the increasing adoption of these, of these methods. Um, I think it could be very important to explore the composition space because we do because it is very slow in turn in the ternary space. You have to try so many different combinations and it's very slow. So this, I think, would be very powerful there um, in terms of using a lower level of theory for the TC to speed things up. Actually, that doesn't help. The, the, the slow thing is calculating the electron phonon coupling constants. So the calculating just calculating the phonons and converging the integrals over the Fermi surface. It's really the fact that you're, you've got this very, these very complicated Fermi surfaces. And you're having to integrate these quite delicate functions. That's what takes all this all this time. You know those. You know Alan Dines, Eli Ashberg, Macmillan. That's just sort of post processing. So so our yes. recommendation probably is just use Eli Ashberg because it you know, works in the wider range or or, or 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 whatever, and is fast compared to having to do do all the phonon calculations. Great. Thank you. Thank you for for your answer. Uh, I don't see any more questions here. So I have a, another maybe final question, uh, which is, I don't know, uh, kind of a, a million dollar question. <laughs> uh, do you think that this hydride family uh, will lead us to, to, to room pressure uh, superconductivity or, or we really have to look at the, into other families? Uh, for instance, is it possible to, to freeze one of these uh, uh, high pressure phases in a metastable uh, uh, state at room temp at, at room pressure, for, for instance. Do you think that's so a, I, a I, I possible think, way to go? Yeah. yeah. So I think that the recovering recovering a highly metastable hydrogen phase down to low pressure is not very likely. Hydrogen is so mobile; it's going to it's going to tunnel away. I mean, it's going to find a way to lower its, its energy. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Our instinct is to say 
that you've got to look so so well, okay what my conventional message has been you've got to look beyond the hydrides for ambient conditions so you should look to strongly bonded covalent carbides nitride borides that kind of stuff okay um but i'm very willing to be surprised now so it's so sort of the, the hint from our survey was that the tc wasn't dropping off too quickly as we got down to 100 gpa now i i really kick myself we should have done 50 you know we should have done 50 gpa that would have given us much more meaningful information but we jumped to 10 and at 10 actually we didn't find anything so that's a bit negative for for this mm -hmm. but on the other side we haven't tried absolutely everything and maybe there's something out there so i you know it's 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 not impossible. Now, I think that the, most people are saying probably we have to look beyond the hydrides for ambient conditions, but I'm very willing to be, I mean, I've already been surprised. I already didn't realize, you know, didn't believe that we would be able to be in the situation we are now. Um, and I think even, so for, you know, what's the, what's the five year goal? The five year goal is to find a bunch of 50 GPA superconductors that many labs around the world can can study and really get to grips with, as, and that's sort of like the base camp for the final push to the to the ambient conditions. But we might just get a surprise, like MGB two came from nowhere. Yeah, there it is. So there's something like that. One lab somewhere, maybe doing the experiment, and bang, they've got it. All right, very good. So uh, uh, there's no more questions. So once again, uh, I would like to thank you, uh, Chris, for, for, for this very nice talk. Uh, as we usually do, uh, I would uh, ask everyone to open their microphones and uh, give uh, Chris uh, a hand of applause uh, for his talk. Chris, and uh, thank you very much. So I will, I will, I will stop the transmission now. Uh, the YouTube transmission. Great, so uh, we're not live anymore, so.